I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I understood what you are uh, driving at. Um, the, main, the main point that I try to, to make is simply that, um, that average standards of living did not rise for thousands of years. Um, for that there, are, there does exist in the meantime overwhelming evidence. I think one of the most um, important books that makes this point is by um, Gregory Clark, Farewell to Arms, who demonstrates, I think quite convincingly, um, that you can go back to the very first records that we have of wages being paid and prices for various goods to come to the conclusion that standards of living in Babylonia were not all that much different from what you find in 1600, 1700, uh, uh, 18, 1800 England. And then how do we explain the fact that it took such an enormous amount of time to gradually strip ourselves out of this predicament. Uh, another important thing is the Industrial Revolution did not take place at, uh, at one specific point in time. Um, it is something that occurred in the course of maybe 200 years. Uh, you could gradually see that mankind improved in this regard um, so that there's some sort of threshold must have been reached um, and that economic theory is in and of itself not able to explain the length of of this process I think there's nothing wrong with economic theory not explaining this so to speak um, as I emphasized I'm of course a strong believer that the uh, tools that economic theory offers us in explaining what is required in order to grow are absolutely correct. Uh, nonetheless, the length of time that it required is inexplicable, so to speak, unless we find some other mechanism that explains this. And this other mechanism is in the course of thousands of years, a different kind of man uh, evolved. And how that happened, the mechanism is uh, economic success is translated into reproductive, reproductive success. So some of these detailed questions were so when uh, it was opportunity cost for this too high or too low and so forth, I'm not trying to answer these types of questions. I have a far more fundamental question. How can we understand the long-run course of human uh, economic history um, with, without recognizing that something like an ongoing biological evolutionary process must have, uh, must have been going on? And once we recognize that, then many, uh, many phenomena 
that we know of do make more sense than if we simply ignore this on, ongoing biological evolutionary process. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Gannon a question. First of all, thank you for your excellent speech. Um, you painted a very necessary The answer is both. Um, we must, of course, continue to attack their legitimizing ideologies. And um, th there are many libertarians and conservatives who are doing a very good job of that. When it comes to labeling members of the ruling class, it, it is necessarily rather difficult because um, these people are not totally parasitic. Uh, sometimes they do act within the productive economy and sometimes they act outside the productive economy. Um, the English radicals of the early 19th century had a distinction between tax eaters and tax payers. And it seems a fairly clear-cut distinction uh, until you look at it in the modern context. You, you see, I occasionally work as a university lecturer. Uh, I'm paid by the state. To that extent, I'm a tax eater. I'm also a taxpayer. Now, um, I suppose if I look at my tax return, I, I can say that on balance, I'm a taxpayer. But I'm sure that I receive many other benefits from the state uh, that I don't take into account. Uh, and so, um, most, it is very difficult to say, in most regards, whether somebody is a tax eater or a taxpayer. And when you look at the uh, wicked Polly Toynbee, uh, for those of you who don't know her, she is a particularly nauseous left-wing journalist who writes for The Guardian. I'm not sure that she gets a penny from the taxpayer. Um, it all comes from The Guardian. But, though, of course, The Guardian gets a lot of its revenue from running all those advertisements for um, you know, AIDS outreach coordinators and walking advisors and parking studies lecturers. But um, you know, it, it is difficult to pin a label on someone and say, you are a member of the ruling class, therefore I want to smash you. I wish we could do it, and in some cases we can, but it, it's not as easy as it seems. I, may, may I add, add something to this? Um, this is, of course, one of the great advantages of the Marxists that they could pinpoint who mm -hmm. is a member of the ruling class and who isn't. He who owns the, the means of production is, and he who doesn't isn't. With this concept of tax eaters and tax payers, the libertarians try to accomplish the same sort of simplicity. Um, you might be able to figure out who is a tax payer and who is a tax eater. Nonetheless, this is not a very good concept in order to determine who is a member of the ruling class, because clearly you would not uh, consider welfare recipients a member of, of the ruling class. Uh, you, you would not consider a plumber working for the state be a member of the ruling class. On the other hand, we have, of course, many people who work entirely outside of the domain of the state who clearly are members of, of the ruling class, leading, leading businessmen uh, who can accomplish, for instance, that legislation is passed that benefits them at the expense of, of their competitors. M nonetheless, in terms of this tax eater, uh, 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 taxpayer uh, dichotomy, uh, they would have to be labeled as people who are outside of, outside of the ruling class. And this was one of the reasons why I asked Sean to just present some thoughts on, uh, on this difficulty that we have. And I do not know how we can overcome it and come up with a clear-cut statement, this guy is an evil guy, so he has to be smashed, and this one is not. It is, we have to just look at in every individual case that makes our case more difficult, I admit, but that's the way it is.
again, I must admit that I'm not quite sure if I got the drift of, of the question. Um, but look, um, hunter and gatherers were under Mal Malthusian conditions again and again and again. It was not only until the point came when absolutely no land was available anymore. Uh, it happened um, hundreds of thousands of times at various locations that Malthusian conditions arose. Why did nobody ever invent agriculture and animal husbandry as a way out of it? And instead it was always people migrating to different, uh, different places. Um, that again we cannot explain unless we have another explanatory dimen dimension that is uh, a growth of, uh, a growth of in intelligence. So it's not only that um, the, the pressure, so to speak, to invent a solution to Malthus the Malthusian trap only arises once the entire globe is settled by hunters and gatherers, but it has happened, of course, before the entire globe was settled by hunters and gatherers, thousands and thousands of times before. And every time uh, a decision had to be made. Hunters and gatherers, from what we know, worked three or four hours per day. Um, so they had plenty of time to think of anything they wanted, uh, but they didn't. Again, I'm not quite sure if I answered your question, but even if I didn't, I hope it still made some sense that what I said apart from that. <coughs> Two parts of the answer. The, the first one is simply we have to we have to see the facts as they are. This is just a positive statement. Is it really the case that there were eugenic effects at work before and dysgenic effects are at work right now? I think many libertarians are entirely blind to the fact that that, that these facts exist. Um, I'm rather convinced that the facts do exist. Um, the second question is, what are we about to do it? Uh, what, what can we do about it? Um, and there, the libertarian answer would be, of course, the, the state has to be eliminated as, as, as far as possible. Uh, welfare state policies have to be eliminated as much as possible. And then it is, of course, 
up to each individual household, so to speak, uh, to balance the number of people that they themselves breed with the resources that they are capable uh, of producing, and then let the market do its work. Um, if I could make a comment on that, which amounts to a question to Hans. Um, I must say that um, your explanation of um, the Industrial Revolution is the first entirely convincing explanation I've seen. All of the others appear to leave something out, whereas what yours does is to explain in a very satisfactory way why it happened when it happened. However, um, what you may be what you are describing may not be um, an upward swing. It, it may be a very, very long cycle, and um, the cycle is not yet over. It may be a very pessimistic theory. It, in fact, you may be another Malthus. Um, we, we reach a certain point in which a combination of circumstances uh, allow um, an economic takeoff. Um, once that happens, you, you have the beginnings of um, government expansion, which brings dysgenic effects, which brings the upward swing to a halt, and uh, for the rest of human history, we just bump along at um, a, a rather flat level, um, perhaps. I, I agree. That might well be a possibility, and actually I thought I indicated that I consider this a very real possibility and, of course, a very real danger, so to speak, that we are uh, have reached, so to speak, the, the, the peak of the development and th there will be a decline uh, from, from now on. I agree with you that there is a ruling class, but, but uh, where I disagree is that I, I'm not quite sure what the common defining characteristic of this thing is. Uh, re regarding, um, regarding the benefits of past ruling classes, 
I, I think um, Henry VIII's musical compositions should be seen more as positive externalities. Um, modern ruling classes do operate consistently within the productive economy in ways that past ruling classes usually didn't. That being said, um, there may well be certain benefits even to the ruling class that we have at the moment. Um, we spend a lot of time as conservatives and libertarians complaining about the wicked things being done to us by our ruling class. The, the enemy class, the neoconservatives, the liberals, call them what you will. Um, but these people do not proceed to the last, to the, to the outer limits of exploitation. They do leave us with um, a, a lot of what we produce, and they don't often take us off and beat us to death in police stations. And so, um, where a Marxist would say, there is the ruling class, brothers, let us rise up and smash it, let us smash the means of production and give them to the workers. Um, we do need to bear in mind that just because a ruling class exists and just because it is doing bad things does not mean that we should, on all occasions, seek to overthrow it. But we need to consider what would replace it. If we could be reasonably sure that overthrowing a ruling class would lead to a significantly better state of affairs from our own point of view, yes, we should become revolutionaries. If, on the other hand, replacing the existing ruling class would bring us something much worse, then there is an argument for putting up with these people, bad as they are. Now, um, at the moment, our ruling classes are becoming so awful in what they're doing and in the tendencies that they're setting that I think there is a very good argument for even the most conservative of us uh, to become revolutionary. But uh, again, unlike the Marxists, I think our class theory is, um, it, it doesn't have the same declamatory ring about it. Workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. We're not even quite sure who the ruling class is. Um, I have two questions about the ruling class. The first one is do you know any society in history that has not had a request because if there hasn't been, then I think we must assume that there is something inherent in human nature mm -hmm. or in human society that makes a ruling class unavoidable. That's it. My other question is this a parasite socially is someone who supports himself say touches on, on what Hans was saying and Richard Lynn, but um, let me deal with the um, parasite aspect. Uh, I agree that when, when members of the ruling class operate within the productive economy, they are more or less not parasitic. Those are their productive activities, which is part of what makes the whole analysis so difficult. 
Uh, but coming back to the question, coming back to the point you made about how every society has had a ruling class, now that is significant. Uh, we can talk about legitimizing ideologies, we can talk about hegemony, discourse theory, false consciousness, and we can use that to explain any one particular ruling class. But every society that has ever existed, every settled society that's ever existed, has had a ruling class. Uh, and it, it may put ordinary people in much the same position as, as certain um, battered wives. You, you often see these uh, prophetic creatures who've been beaten up by their drunken, disgusting husbands. And um, you, you, there are people who help these women get away from those disgusting men. And then six months later, they're in an equally abusive relationship. Now, that may, be what hu that may be what the human race is like with regard to ruling classes. You can explain the exploitation of any one class by using all these fancy terms, but uh, the fact that people have always had a ruling class uh, may indicate that... Um, would, would it be uncharitable to say that most people are stupid? I, I, I want to make a comment. And I do not think it is correct to say that every society had a ruling class. Um, every society, or this leads me to make a distinction what the meaning of ruling class is, every society has, so to speak, rulers. Every society has people who exercise authority. Uh, every society has leaders who, whose word counts for more than other people's. What we mean by a ruling class, however, is something different from just simply having people who exercise authority. What we mean by ruling class is people who have acquired means in illegitimate ways. As a, people have established monopolies, people who have stolen the property of other individuals and then draw income from positions that were acquired in an illegitimate way, in a way that involves the infringement of private property rights. So in this sense, of course, it is incorrect to say that a ruling class has existed as long as mankind exists. Rulers have existed as long as mankind exists. Authorities have existed as long as mankind exists. But it is not necessarily the case that these rulers have acquired their means, uh, their property in an illegitimate way. They can have also acquired that in a completely legitimate way and then exercise their authority based on that position. No, we, can, we will not do five questions. We will do one more question, then I want to say a few final remarks, and then we should uh, retire. One more question. Hmm. 
Well, I think both your questions um, come, in, come under one heading. Uh, what you're asking again is the question that I asked but didn't really satisfactorily answer. Should we talk about a ruling class or should we talk about a cluster of um, mutually hostile groups uh, who all to some extent have um, influence with the state? I, I think that we can talk about a single ruling class um, but there are considerable difficulty, at least in my mind, before I can give, um, if I can give a clear view of it. Well, I think that should end, end this discussion. Um, I, I, don't want, I don't want to add anything to it. I agree with what you said. Um, so it is now uh, up to me only to say a few, a few things. I, First of all, I, I want to uh, thank you very much that you attended this conference. I, I hope you enjoyed it. My purpose with this conference is um, over the years to, to create the best, the most educational, the most entertaining, the most inter enlightening, and also the most fun conference uh, that exists anywhere. Um, <laughs> If, if there's someone who didn't like the conference, he shouldn't come again. Uh, <laughs> if, uh, if you did like the conference, please tell your friends about it. So through mouth-to-mouth -mouth propaganda, uh, that this, this will become a more and more exclusive type conference. I do not want to have the conference bigger, but I want to be a conference that everybody clamors to get to. Um, and uh, the, final, the final announcement um, that I want to make is uh, next year uh, the conference will take place again, uh, most likely one week later. Uh, so at the very end of May, um, maybe a few days into June. So if you like the conference, please mark your calendar accordingly and in, in due time the exact announcement or the announcement of the exact dates uh, will appear on our website. With that, now let's have fun again. Okay.